I was hoping that my children would never have to worry about nuclear war. Unfortunately, the risk is higher today than it was ever before. The aftermath of a nuclear war would be a nuclear winter. But scientists have been arguing about what that would mean for decades, a problem that's closely related to supervolcano eruptions, which are almost certain to come. Today I have an update on this and also some recommendations from scientists that I'm sure we'll take very seriously. Let's have a look. During the Cold War, the number of nuclear warheads in the world was over 70,000. Today we're at about 12,000. Progress, but still plenty to wreck the planet. No one knows exactly who has how many, but it seems that most of the active nuclear warheads are in Russia, closely followed by the United States, each with about 4,000. Then there's a big gap, and then follows China with about 600, France, the UK, and a few few others. The doomsday clock, which symbolically measures how close the world is to nuclear war, is currently at 89 seconds to midnight, closer than it's ever been before. If you have trouble believing that, remember that in the past years we've seen two presidents discussing the nuclear option, mind you, not with each other. It's just that we've gotten so numb no one's paying attention anymore. Good thing you have me to remind you how far we are. A nuclear war could kill tens of millions of people in the first attacks, but the real problem comes afterwards. This is the so-called nuclear winter. Nuclear bombs would likely be aimed at cities. The detonations and shock wave would cause widespread fires. Fires of that extent are likely to cause a firestorm, that's a funnel of hot air that drags ashes high into the atmosphere. Such a firestorm is basically impossible to put out, certainly not by dead people, and in cities there's all kinds of different materials that burn. An immediate problem is the nuclear fallout, though most of the radioactive contamination would likely remain within the impact regions. The biggest trouble is all the ash and soot, much of it from synthetic materials that gets trapped in the upper atmosphere. Because once it's up there, it distributes around the globe and doesn't come down with rain. It'll block sunlight and cause temperatures to drop swiftly. Depending on how many cities were burnt into the ground, that could range from a drop of 5 to 20 degrees Celsius and last 5 to 10 years until the ash slowly clears out. A similar thing would happen after a supervolcano eruption, which is in my opinion a rather underestimated threat, and in contrast to nuclear war, there's nothing we can do to prevent it. Our planet has about a dozen supervolcanoes, those which can eject more than a thousand cubic meters of material in one blast. We know this has happened repeatedly in the past. One of the most famous examples is Yellowstone. It had three mega eruptions in the past two million years, each of which covered most of the western US in ash a foot deep. It'll erupt again. The question is just when. Then there are the skeptics. Nuclear winter was hotly debated in the 1990s when skeptics claimed the fears were overblown. It'd be more of a nuclear autumn, they said, with much milder cooling. This doubt resurfaced a few years ago when some studies from American Institute suggested that firestorms wouldn't be as bad as earlier models claimed. However, these claims have been outliers in a bulk of research. Most of the studies agree that the nuclear winter would be devastating. The biggest problem would be crop failure. Modern agriculture, especially cultivated wheat, corn and rice, is highly efficient. The world's population depends on it remaining so. A steep drop in temperatures and sunlight would lead to widespread famine within less than a year. A 2020 Rutgers study found that a large-scale nuclear war war between the United States and Russia could kill 5 billion people indirectly through starvation in the decade afterwards. If you think that sounds dire, a new study from researchers at Penn State just found that this was too optimistic. The earlier models, they say, didn't take into account that all the soot in the atmosphere would damage the ozone layer and increase ultraviolet radiation. That isn't just bad for your skin, it's also bad for many crops. They say that crop yields could go down by up to 80% for a large-scale global war. They don't calculate how many people that are killed, but it'd be even more than the 5 billion. So what can we do? 
Well, if you have nuclear codes, please don't use them. For the rest of us, researchers suggest that we should prepare to quickly switch to less cold-sensitive crops like potatoes or kale. The most resilient edible plant they found is seaweed, which has the added benefit that it grows very quickly and could be scaled up to meet demands within months if we're prepared to pull it off, which of course we're not. Not the most cheerful topic, I know, but I think that we should at least try to prepare for these existential threats like we try to prepare for asteroids heading our way. And I hope that this video at least draws a little attention to it. Really though, we need to have a serious discussion about whether kale counts as food. But no matter how big our problems might seem, I strongly believe that together we can solve them. The best example for how much we can achieve together that I can think of are my friends at Planet Wild, who are saving this planet one step at a time. Planet Wild is a community-based environmental protection organization. They're funding the restoration of ecosystems to preserve our nature and wildlife by partnering with different organizations every month. I've been been part of their community for years now and I've been really impressed by their work. They document all their projects with video reports that you can find right here on YouTube. This way you get to see the immediate impact of your contribution. For example, they've recently been cleaning one of Europe's most polluted rivers before the plastic reaches the sea. And they did this with a brilliant technique, using a repurposed weed harvester boat, a Soviet factory and a dam. All of this is made possible by a 13,000 member community of nature enthusiasts like you and I. You can become a nature supporter by giving any amount you can, big or small. Every contribution makes a difference. And don't worry that you'll get stuck with them. You can cancel your membership at any time. I'll cover the first month of your subscription if you're among the first 100 people signing up with the code SABINA48. Go check them out through the link in the description or by scanning the QR code and consider becoming a supporter. You'll see your impact in less than 30 days. If you're still not convinced and would like to learn more about Planet Wild first, check out how they cleaned up one of Europe's most polluted rivers here. Thanks for watching. See you tomorrow.